thank you, Rod, for that kind introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's really a privilege to, to talk to you today. Um, as Rod mentioned, I will be defending my PhD in three days, so this is a great opportunity to, to practice a little bit, but also to share um, the journey with you, like the, the aspect of our family and, and kind of highlight our results. So if you were expecting a really traditional PhD defense, that's not quite what we're going to do, but we are going to summarize our findings, um, explore a little bit what they really mean, and then hopefully have a little fun with it. So as everybody still finds their seat, um, usually in this kind of presentation, the thank yous are at the end. And I feel it always gets overlooked. So I'm, I want to do it now. Because there's been so many incredible clinicians and researchers um, that have worked here, that have contributed to making this project a success. So um, especially my two supervisors, so Professor Eric Vitfro and Professor Roald Baum. So a big thank you to all of you. Um, Maybe the biggest thanks goes to all the clinicians in the National Sports Medicine Program. So all the doctors and physios who collect data on a daily basis, who treat the, who's involved with the players on a daily basis. Uh, without you, none of this is possible. So um, also the screening department, so Dr. Steve Target has given over the reins to Dr. Eman Ergen. But the whole department, Nelly and a team of nurses, we've collaborated over the last five years and it's been great. And then lastly, <clears throat> that said me not least, my own department. This is an old picture, unfortunately, but so you know we've changed a bit. But um, to all the clinicians that I work with that have supported and motivated this over the years, um, I'm deeply grateful. So I know it's Tuesday morning. I know we not need to wake up a little bit. So we're going to do three little, little exercises. So this is an awareness test. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. Pretty good. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So if, you, if you're familiar with this video, that wouldn't have been a surprise to you. I think some of you actually did miss it. So it's hard not to see it when you know this now, right? But this was a UK road cycling awareness campaign, and it, it is a, a good example of a cognitive uh, bias, right? or attention bias, really. This one you might know uh, well. Like, who hasn't seen this before? Right, so the question here is, which of the horizontal lines are shorter? And now I guess I kind of give it away. Even when I color them in, every time I see this, this is called the Mueller liar illusion. And every time I see this, the bottom line looks short term. And it's only when we take away the arrows that we see that they are really the same length. So this is a good example of a visual illusion. So that's exercise two. That wasn't too hard. Uh, so the third one is a little bit of maths. OK, that's, I mean, nobody's doing maths, hopefully, to get that answer. 2 plus 2 is 4. So we all know that you don't have to think about that, right? You just know 2 plus 2 is 4. But how about this one? So Rod, no, you're not allowed to answer. Everybody else. OK, so don't get out your iPhones. Um, I'll give you some suggestions. What about 12,609? Any? No? No? OK, how about 123? Good. Uh, how about 568? Right? Right? So the answer is 408 for those of you who won't be able to continue listening if I don't tell you. But this is a really good example of how what we do when we're faced with difficult decisions um, or difficult problems. And it's explained really well in this book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Dan Kahneman. So Dan Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002 but he's not an economist, he's a psychologist. And it's his work in behavioral sciences that won him the Nobel Prize, because he showed us that 
when we're faced with difficult problems, and this was really in banking and investing, but when we're faced with difficult problems, we're not as good at solving them as we think we are. So what happens when we have a difficult maths question like 17 times 24 is exactly what we did, right? We either do the math, so you actually get out a piece of paper, like if you're me and you do it, or you guess, because 568 looks about right, or you substitute the difficult question for the easy one. And so the answer is four. It's maths. I know other math question, the answer there is four, so this has to be four as well. So I know you've heard hamstring injury lectures at Aspital a lot, but I thought we'd use Dan Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow when we look at our risk factors for hamstring injuries and look at the results of this, um, this uh, project. So in case you think I forgot, I didn't. You can tick off the box. Uh, and we do this so often now, I thought I'd just prove I'm not a robot. Um, but the learning objectives uh, for today, and this is really a three-point three summary of my PhD as well, is understanding the difference between injury prediction and risk factor identification, uh, figuring out whether injury risk is actually influenced by rehabilitation, what we do, and then looking at variability. So how stable, how good are the risk factors that we're looking at? Now, I'm just going to set up the context a little bit because I realize that a lot of you uh, might not know the, the backstory behind this project. Like any good PhD student, um, <clears throat> when we started, we were looking at some of the big questions the world has to answer. And a good place to go is the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. So these are all obviously really important. Poverty, education, the environment, equality. <clears throat> but I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking as well about the same thing. And I have emailed them. So hopefully in the next round, um, when they publish this again, they'll add this really important question we have to answer as well. No, so of course, we're not quite there. But hamstrings is a big deal in our game, in sports medicine, and especially, particularly in football. Because it is the most common injury we see. And tweets like this makes it great. There's nothing wrong with this tweet, right? That picture of that player's hamstrings does look brilliant. Um, but if we think, so if we're thinking fast, but if we're thinking slow, if we engage our system too, or our, our deeper thinking about this, then they're not that great. This particular player has actually had a bunch of injuries and he's, it's kept him out of the game for a long time. In fact, for this guy, it's had a major impact on his life and his activities of daily living. I mean, can you imagine driving to training in your VW Polo? when everybody's coming in their Maseratis. That's not easy, right? So no, hamstrings are a big deal. We know from the UEFA group that they represent about 37% of the injuries we see. And from the work by Dr. Cristiano here in Aspatar or in Qatar, we know that if you're at a club here, you can expect about six or seven of them every season. So how do we address this? How do we, how do we fix the hamstring problem? So from a research point of view, we have to go back to Willem von Mechelen's injury prevention model from 1992. So it's basically four steps. First, you establish the extent of the problem. So that's usually incidence and severity. In step two, we look at the etiology and the mechanisms responsible for uh, the injury. In step three, we look for a way to prevent them. And in step four, we just test again whether the, 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 the problem has gotten less or not. So it's really looking at the magnitude of the problem, try and identify risk factors or causes for them in step two, figuring out our prevention program and then testing it again. And Willem himself has acknowledged that actually this model has a flaw. If we're really scientific, we need to do a randomized control trial between step three and four. Ruald has suggested that clinicians, like most of you, might actually think differently. So we take the prevention program to address the risk factors that leads to hopefully less injuries and hopefully some sort of performance, some kind of success. Now, whether you're a researcher or a clinician or both, the key here is identifying these risk factors. So in 2009, the IOC proposed exactly that, that we need large scale population based studies to identify the athletes at risk so we can intervene and change the outcome. And they recommended that periodic health evaluations or screening be set up as research projects. So in 2012, Aspatar uh, decided to launch exactly such a project. And the Aspatar Sports Injury and Illness Prevention Program uh, was initiated. And under this umbrella, we've been able to do a large 
a large or a number of large population-based studies. Now, I just want to mention that I'm part of a much bigger group and our hamstring work has been one of our great successes. Over 20 publications in some of the world's leading sports medicine journals. So for a non-academic institution, that's a significant contribution to the literature. And I'm one of many, there's, there's been a few hamstring PhDs, so the guys on the left are all done. Uh, Dr. Van Amada has left as well, but if you see these two guys run, because Robin is running our randomized controlled trial, he's looking for more subjects, so he's gonna try and make you have a hamstring injury. And Fergal is our postdoc researcher, and he's looking at changes associated with training, so he might make you do a lot of training. So if we look at my part, uh, the risk factor project started back in 2010 before I even arrived and we decided to initiate this, uh, this, this project. In 2013 my PhD started together with uh, the PhE or the screening as a research project. We collected data over two seasons and I'm really happy to say that all these papers are now either published or accepted. So you might ask why DOA? Why is Qatar a good place to run this kind of population-based studies? So I'm going to explain that by looking at this map. I know some of the clubs have changed. This is a bit older, right? But um, it serves the point. So I'll get rid of all the streets. So if you arrive at Hamad International Airport, it's a pretty short drive to get to Aspatar. And I think I could probably visit all these clubs in one day. So this gives us an incredible geographical advantage. On top of that, the Qatar Stars League, in col collaboration with Aspatar, made it mandatory for all their players that participate to undergo annual screening. So this gave us enormous leverage to run these big projects. Because that's what we wanted to do. For hamstring injuries, we wanted to figure out which or what predictive factors could we find for, for hamstring injuries, and then also potential causative associations or relationships with these factors and injuries. In a large prospective cohort study, which hadn't been done up, in, up until this stage. So we always have smaller studies, but they're limited by the sample size or the number of injuries. So we're always left with wondering, can I find these strong relationships in bigger studies? So here's what we did. In 2010, we started our isokinetic strength protocol. So it includes a pretty standard isokinetic protocol, uh, quadriceps and hamstrings concentric strength at slow and high speed and hamstrings eccentric strength at slow speed. All of this is done to also develop hamstrings to quadriceps or quadriceps to hamstring ratios. So pretty standard um, and very popular ways of measuring strength in the literature. Since 2013, we, all, we continued with the standard examination but also included novel uh, measures, so the Nordic hamstring exercise and a dynamic approach to this HQ ratio. We also looked at rate of torque development and onset of muscle activity, so if you'll allow the term intrinsic neuromuscular function, and then uh, active and passive range of motion of the posterior thigh, and then also dorsiflexion range of motion of the ankle, so measures of flexibility. So this is how this shaped up. In the first paper we published, we look at just the isokinetics over four seasons, and we were able to include 190 injuries in this study. In the second major part of this investigation for my project, we looked at two seasons, continued with the isokinetics, but included all these novel measures, still had a sufficient number of injuries to do some appropriate analysis, but a large amount of data to get through, and um, Professor Angus Burnett made that a lot easier for me, but really a large uh, prospective look at these different risk factors that had not been done before. So this kind of leads us now. So in the second part, we also measured exposure. So now we were able to do a much more robust regression analysis, a, more, a good, better way of looking at it statistically. And this leads us to our, our first question. Can we identify predictive factors? Uh, and what does that mean in terms of risk? So in the first paper, we found two. Decreased quadriceps concentric strength and decreased hamstrings eccentric strength associated with, significantly associated with a higher risk of injury. And those odds ratios indicate about a 40% increase in risk. In the second studies, we looked at strength again, now 24 variables, but only one when we categorized the variables. So when we looked at quad strength and we, we 
took the, the mean, and one standard deviation above the mean is the strong guys, and one standard deviation below is the weak guys, the strong guys had, were twice as likely to have a hamstring injury. And then flexibility, so passive uh, knee extension range of motion and dorsiflexion lunge. So they're a 3 to 7% increase in risk, but all of these were statistically significant. Now if we're thinking fast, that's the end of the story. We've done our job. These risk factors are important. I just find the weak and the stiff guys, and we treat them, and we should be able to, to fix the hamstring problem. But that's not quite the whole story. So we have to think about what that really means. And I'm going to use Rod's infographic in BJSM from 2016 to help us understand that. Because if I say your risk has increased, I have to understand from where. What did I start with? What is my risk anyway? So if you knew nothing about your player, he's either going to have a hamstring injury or not, right? It's kind of like tossing a coin. So heads or tails. 50% chance. So a 50% chance of injury means one out of two or odds of one to one. So heads to tails. So if I have a test with a likelihood ratio of two, that increases my odds to two to one. Now if you're thinking fast, like, oh, it's double, it's 100% now for sure, but that's, I know you know that's not the answer, right? So it's two out of three now, which means we've had a 16% increase in risk. So let's look at our findings, and I'll, I'll concentrate on the eccentric strength finding, which I think is one of the most popular things we look at. So this odds ratio means there's a 37% increase in risk. If we apply that odds ratio, we need to know the base rate. So what are the chances of having a hamstring injury in our, our league anyway? And again, from Cristiano's work, we know that it's about 11%, 1 out of 9, or odds of 1 to 8, right? So 11%. If we apply our odds ratio there, we find post-test odds of 14.6%, so a 3.5% increase in risk. Now, how many of you are going to change your clinical practice because the risk has increased by 3.5%? No one? Anybody? Yeah, I know that's a bit, that's a bit of an unfair question because it's contextual, right? But I think if we have this conversation with coaches, most of them will go, look, buddy, like, congratulations, but that doesn't really change anything for me. So do we have any more evidence of how strong this relationship is? A best, a best way to look at that is the effect size. So effect size, if you're not familiar with it, is really the quantitative measure, the strength of a variable. How, how strong is the effect? How big is the effect we'll see? And an effect size of one is really important, right? That's a big deal. So as you can see, for both the strength and the flexibility variables, uh, it never reaches more than 0 0.3. So we interpret that as small. And I've shown you there the absolute difference between the injured and the uninjured players, the mean difference. Now, for eccentric strength on the biodex, a lot of you will know you get about 180, almost 200 newton meters. So a difference of 7 newton meters is not, not really big. Um, and then the same for flexibility. 2 degrees or 1.5 centimeters is not a big change between the injured and the uninjured players. Because we have an even bigger problem then, right? So these small effect sizes, the small differences means that it's hard to differentiate between these players. So to explain that on this graph, I've plotted the injured guys in red and the uninjured guys in blue. So the percentage players on the y-axis and their strength uh, normalized to body weight on the x-axis. Now if I test my player at the beginning of the season, whether he's strong or whether he's kind of weak, I really don't know if he's going to be in the injured group or the uninjured group. And that's what makes this so difficult. This, uh, this group finding, and it's statistically significant, don't get me wrong, right? We've shown that there's a relationship, albeit not a big one, but a relationship between strength flexi and flexibility and having a hamstring injury. So there's, it's part of the causative nature of these injuries, but I cannot apply that to the individual. So let me use another example uh, that makes it a little bit more obvious. Um, we all know that men are statistically significantly taller than women, right? So I'll pick a random girl out of the audience. Uh, Martina, why don't you come up? Oh, you know she's taller from sitting over <laughs> there, right? So obviously I have to be taller than this woman because we found a statistically significant finding in the group. Thank you. <laughs> so that's, I mean, when we do it like that, it's really obvious, right? When we have this continuous variable, it's harder, but we can't really identify the athletes at risk. And that's why we've interpreted these small associations 
uh, as weak risk factors for hamstring injuries because they simply lack the clinical utility we really need when we're using these tests um, in our practice. At least in isolation. The way we've done it in isolation, they don't really um, have much meaning for us. Now, before you start tweeting that I think screening is useless, we've just uh, published the editorial in BJSM say, saying exactly the opposite. Screening isn't useless. There's loads of good reasons to do it. And in this editorial, we use the example of previous injury to show that we have to interpret the risk uh, carefully for when we get to the individual. But this kind of leads us into our second question. So can or is injury risk influenced by rehab? Now, as the more perceptive of you might have noticed, I haven't put up our uh, rate of talk development or onset of muscle activity uh, findings yet. And that's because they were not significant. So rate of talk development over the first 100 milliseconds, so the initial phase of the movement, how fast can you develop force through that phase? Um, this is really hard kind of this or hard research to do. So there's lots of variability in this, but we didn't find this prospectively. So we could stop there, think, thinking fast, we're done. Easy, these aren't important, throw them out. But if we look a little bit at the literature and we know what happens after an injury or after a player's return to sport even, we know that we do find changes in these factors. So the work from David Opar and the group in Australia have shown that there's a significant difference between the injured and the uninjured players. So all that's happened is you've had an injury, you've had rehab, and now you've returned to sport, but it seems like these deficits persist. So does that ask questions of our rehabilitation? And the same thing for muscle activity. We don't find them prospectively. So it looks like these things are a consequence rather than a cause of hamstring injury, but it does hold some implication for our rehab. Now, like I said, in the editorial, uh, we looked at previous injury because, as many of you would know, previous injury is the strongest risk factor we have for hamstring injuries, for any sports injury. And this paper by Arnie Arneson had the biggest result so far, so a seven times increase in risk. So, of course, in our analysis, we included previous injury as a risk factor. And indeed, in the first paper, we do find it um, significantly associated with the risk of injury. But interestingly, in our second part of our project, over the two seasons we looked at, it disappears. Now, we really have to think a little bit more about that, because this strong risk factor suddenly isn't there anymore. Now, in this closed environment we have in Qatar, where we really work together and we're, we're, it's really linked, concurrently to our risk factor project, we also started a rehabilitation randomized control trial. The PRP study, you might remember that, uh, and then when that study finished, we started a second randomized control trial that's still ongoing, and Robin is looking after that. So in both of these, whether you were in the intervention group or the control group, you got a criteria-based progressive rehab program. So you got really good rehab. And of course, at the clubs, that's a little bit different, but a lot of this knowledge was shared, and we talked about this, and I'm sure a lot of these principles were applied at the club as well. So the players in Qatar suddenly had really good rehabilitation and perhaps in this cohort it's a plausible explanation for why the risk associated with previous injury is suddenly not found anymore. So we've published our uh, rehab uh, protocol uh, for, for everybody to, to see um, and everybody that's been involved in that has been really uh, instrumental. But this rehab program might actually offset our risk. So then the last question, how stable are these things we're looking at? Because we need to know if they're very variable or not. So we're going to stick with hamstring eccentric strength. And we were fortunate to have players that tested in two consecutive seasons. So we had follow-up tests, right, season one, and then again in season two. Not all of the guys, but a large proportion, about 180 of them. And here, I've plotted their strength in season two on the y-axis and their strength in season one on the x-axis. Now, this would be the identity line. So in a perfect world, in a perfectly correlated uh, variable, all the little dots would sit exactly on this line. Both the injured, that's black, and the uninjured, that's open. The closed and open symbols. But clearly, that looks a little bit more like a dartboard, right? Because if I test a player in season two, and he had 200, he might have only tested, uh, only have had 100 uh, in season one. So of course, there are many mechanisms that could explain this change, but we have to acknowledge that there's, a, that there's a large amount of variability here. So that's our regression line. 
and we observed a measurement error of around 26 or 27 newton meters, so 15% measurement error in these tests. So we have to, when we interpret the results, when we look at our players and our screening, we have to remember that there's a substantial amount of variability in these tests. Remember, there was only a seven newton meter difference between the uninjured, uninjured and injured players. And our variability is almost four times that. So if you get that kind of difference, you don't know whether that's a real change or still part of the normal variation we might see. Right, so in summary, this is uh, the results in a nutshell. Our risk factors for hamstring injuries show that strength and flexibility are weak risk factors and poor predictors. So they're important part of the causative nature of these injuries, but they're not useful in predicting injuries or identifying the really high risk groups. So we need to move away from trying to predict and really understand how we use these uh, measures to, I to identify risk or to look at a pl player's complete profile. Rate of torque development and the timing of muscle onset seems like the consequence rather than the cause of hamstring injury and also rehab influences your risk of injury. If we do a good job in rehab, we might offset the risk associated with previous injury. So yes, 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 for sure, our rehab is important to also address risk. And then we do find substantial variability and that affects the stability of the risk factors we look at. So we need to incorporate that. We need to understand that when we're trying to interpret our results. Now I could stop there, but you're still with me. Do you want to have a little fun? Right? So let's think about what this means for the future. Because I think that it raises some questions, at least for me, at the end of this process, that I think is where we need to go. So we know that these things don't predict, right? We, we look at eccentric strength, uh, flexibility in these risk factor papers, and they don't predict well. But we know that we have a bunch of studies showing that intervention uh, using Nordic hamstring exercises, for one, reduces the injuries. They, so they work, but we have this disconnect between risk factor papers and intervention papers. So the question then is, is why? Why do we find this? Why don't we identify strong relationships with these risk factors that we know, if we address them, work? So, I think if you reach a certain stage in your research career, you can just call it like it is. Maybe I'm not quite there yet. But Roald is obviously alluding to something uh, when he did this uh, presentation at the IOC Injury Prevention Conference in Monaco. So let's look at this video. So can you guys see where the hamstring injury happens? That's pretty obvious, right? So you can see it, right? So it's going to play again. I mean, I'm sure you all can see exactly the moment where that injury occurs, right? Because it's, it's so obvious. Right, so no, right? That's a joke, maybe not a good one. But so obviously we can't, right? Uh, because this thing is complex. This player has done this sprint, this change in direction thousands of times. So why this one? Why is this one the one where he gets injured? And more importantly, is there a way for us to know that it will be this one? Now, because this thing is so complex, we know that these different variables are playing a role. So we tend to think of this as an isolated incident, but it might be happening over the last month, six months, and different factors that are playing a role. It's a little bit like riding a bike. So when we ride a bike, there's uh, many different components. Actually, there's about 25 different mathematical variables that keeps a bike upright, from the gyroscopic nature of the wheel to the uh, um, to the f angle of the fork to the ground, even the, the guy on the bike, the human riding the bike. So all these things come together and hamstrings are kind of the same, right? I mean, you know all these factors. We look at these factors often. These are the risk factors we investigate. So what we really want is to understand how they interact, how these different factors may mediate and moderate each other to eventually lead to the event or the injury. Now, um, to understand or to kind of explain this kind of complexity, in 2016, Natalie Bittencourt used some of the principles in complex systems theory to kind of build on the injury prevention models we had and incorporate them into a new model, a new concept. And so all these different factors would be one of these little circles, and they're all connected, and they regulate a certain pattern that either leads to adaptation in the player and that regulates back down, the little factors interact again, or eventually to an event, it, an, an injury would emerge. 
Now, this new concept maybe isn't really that new. So 40 years ago, in 1976, Rothman produced this paper in uh, epidemiology. It's kind of the same, isn't it? Uh, there's different causes that comes together. So in this, for this particular disease, there would be three causes that's made up of different components. But for the disease to happen, all these things need to come together, need to be present for the disease to, to be, to be uh, recognized. So um, this is kind of similar. And, and so in some way, we've appreciated complexity in medicine for some while, although, and particularly in sports medicine, um, it's taken time for that to transfer to our clinical practice. This is why prevention works. So why we see this difference in our risk factor studies and our prevention studies, because if you can uh, address just one of these little components, that might help that the whole system doesn't work, that the disease can't be present, because this all needs to work together. Now, do we have examples where we can measure, we can understand uh, this kind of complexity? Maybe. So that's a terrible accident. But this is the onboard camera um, in a Tesla. So Tesla is uh, moving towards automated driverless cars. And they've built a lot of artificial intelligence into their vehicles. These artificial intelligence, this computer, this uh, system, takes information from traffic patterns, from the car in front and behind and side, from the driver's own uh, driving experience or uh, uh, regular ways of driving. And all this information comes together to build in different kinds of automation. And in this case, a warning system. So did you hear the little beeps in the video? Okay, I'll, I'll play it again. So right there is where the system warns the driver that there's danger ahead, that an accident's going to happen. Can you see that? I mean, we can't know that there's an accident ahead, but taking all this information together, this artificial intelligence automated system can. Now, could we do the same in sports uh, to avoid injury? to avoid accidents from happening, maybe. So <laughs> maybe not quite there yet. So this is uh, Liverpool playing Crystal Palace uh, just a few, um, a few weeks ago. And in this game, a player that was at Aspital for treatment, Adam Lalana, makes his return to the, to the field. So he's just been on the field for about 10 minutes. And right there, he gets into this really awkward position and has a hamstring injury. Now, everybody's ex excited about this player's return. He's a World Cup prospect. He's on the field for 10 minutes. Could we build a system that warns this player of the danger ahead? Maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're not quite there yet, but that's certainly what we would want to do. This is what we do at the moment. So we'll take eccentric strength again. We measure a variable at the beginning of a season, right? And so let's say player A in red and player B in gray. And then uh, player A being rather strong and player B being, let's say, average. Then we look at these players over the season and there's an injury, let's say, in October. Now we look back to May and we see, ah, oh, yes, player A was strong, player B not, and that's what's causing the injury, this difference in strength. But what if I could give you all the information in between those two points? Who are you more worried about now? The player that's around average but kind of steady, right? There's not much fluctuation there. Or this player in red that's clearly had a drop in strength. I would say that's the player I would be more concerned about. Now, if I had workload data for these players, that would be even better. Because now I can explain it, right? There's an increase in the workload data as there's a decrease in the strength. So that would make sense. And if I saw that, where there's a drop off in the workload and then a sudden spike, I know that that could possibly explain why this player had an injury. Now, if I see that, where there's a drop in strength and workload, that's the kind of thing I would be worried about. That's the kind of system I would want to build that would warn us that this pattern doesn't make sense right now and we need to protect this player because he might be at high risk of injury. We don't know at the moment if this is more valuable than one soft testing, but that is, I think, where we need to go. The only way we actually answer this question is by studying it. 
So in his incredible book, Sapiens, Yuval Harari talks about the different revolutions that leverage our potential to create success, to be successful. And um, one of them were the scientific, uh, was the scientific revolution. So research, when we started this, this research quest to understand things, it created more power. This power led to greater resources. And we were able to better understand and create again uh, our leverage, our power to, to change things. So research is vital for us to better understand what we do. And in the world we live in today, it is going to become more and more important. The insurers, uh, the players will demand from us outcome-based uh, treatments, outcome-based results. And to do that, we need the data. Now, we cannot work in isolation anymore. We wrote this editorial a couple of years ago, but it really encourages not only the governing bodies and the big institutions, but every single clinician, every one of you, to contribute, to, to collect data on a daily basis when you're treating your patients, because only then will we be able to leverage our collective strength and answer these questions, and hopefully contribute more successfully to preventing not only hamstring injuries, but perhaps all sports injuries. Thank you for your attention, and uh, if you're uh, looking for a good conference this year, a lot of the aspects of folks will be in Barcelona in June, so it promises to be a really good conference again. Thank you.